So thanks everyone for coming to this English Australia webinar about supporting teachers in blended learning. My name is Sophie O'Keefe and I'm the Professional Development Manager at English Australia and I have the pleasure of facilitating this afternoon's discussion. So today's session will be a chat with two people who've been involved in PD programs supporting teachers to work in blended learning and who both also put together programs to assist teachers with the move to online teaching when COVID hit. So um, welcome to our panellists. Thanks for coming. Heno Kotze is an Ellicos teacher who works at the Institute of Continuing and TESOL Education, ICT, at the University of Queensland. And Kirsty Fees is the senior teacher for blended learning at Hawthorne, Melbourne, which is a Navitas Academy. Thanks so much for joining us again, Heno and Kirsty. Um, Heno and Kirsty are also um, two of the conveners of the English Australia EdTech SIG, along with Kelly Mannix. And today's session is actually being live streamed to the EdTech SIG Facebook group. So if you haven't joined the EdTech SIG discussions on their Facebook group, I'll pop the um, link for how you can join into the chat in a little bit. So during this webinar, um, it'll be a casual conversation with Heno and Kirsty, well, where I'll be asking them a series of questions. But um, please, if you do have any questions for them or comments for them, please type them into the Q&A box and we will try to address all of the questions if we have time. And we'd actually like to begin today's session by discussing the meaning of the term blended learning, because I think it's true to say that in English language teaching, blended learning can mean different things to different people in different contexts. And so we wanted to ask you, our audience members, what the term blended learning means to you. So could you please type a quick comment into the chat just now, um, telling us what blended learning evokes for you in your context. While we're waiting, I can quickly just put that um, link to the group in the chat. Good idea. Thanks, Hello. So for people who've just joined us, um, we're just typing in some comments about what the term blended learning means to you in your context. Hmm. So there's some comments coming through in the chat now. Yeah, I think there's some really good points there. And I'm, I think it, it's, I mean, we've spoken about this before, but it's this idea of um, just this combination of, of media, isn't it? It's yeah. this, this idea of combining online and face-to-face, -face, but it, 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 the context is so important because, you know, pre-COVID days, it was, yeah. whoa, using a mobile phone in the classroom to do a, a quiz or you know some kind of student response tool or working on a on a laptop together in the call lab or whatever it might have been to to look up some um facts for your essay or whatever it might be and and now it's suddenly taken on a whole different meaning because now we've got you know hybrid learning we've got all kinds of different um combinations of media going on um yeah yeah, it's interesting what Madeline said about um, uh, introducing online students as present. That's something that wouldn't have been included in a blended learning um, traditional definition probably a year ago. And now it's becoming more and more prevalent for a lot of people. But it really depends where you are. I mean, some centres are doing it. Some centres are not allowed to have that kind of hybrid model. And they're still using a, a bit more of a traditional blended learning situation. 
So it, it's not really, yeah, it's not right to have one definition. It's good that everybody's got something a bit different. Yeah. Oh, what was it? It was in that um, latest issue of human, humanizing language teaching that um, yeah. I think it was um, Yolanta and, and Joe Roberts, they wrote um, an article on, you know, CELTA during COVID times. And the sort of premise of the article was that this, this hybrid of a, of a CELTA or a teacher training course of, you know, an online and a face-to-face -face component, um, you know, would, would work really well. And I guess, you know, there's another, there's another um, blended learning model. It might not necessarily be happening at the same time, um, mm -hmm. because you might do the, you know, the face-to-face -face mod module and then you do the online one or whatever it might be. But again, there's another, there's another example. And I guess, yeah, it just shows that there's so many different um, ways you can interpret the term. Yeah. Hmm. My particular context, now that we're all uh, learning to live in a COVID world, we're, we're purely online and blended learning has definitely moved away from what you were saying, Heno, where it's bringing tech into a traditional classroom and sort of using a mobile phone or a lap to extend the classroom or, or add an extra layer to the classroom. And now the tech is just everything. So that blended learning becomes a different type of combined learning. And it's really more about trying to find a balance between synchronous and asynchronous and a balance between teacher-led teaching and really student training and independent student work and um, and even a balance between um, you know teacher expectations and student expectations it's it's much more a, a new combination rather than that traditional blended learning definition yeah absolutely and I think it begs the question too when everything is already sort of digital and online now um, you know open, opening one more tab for your for, 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 for this activity or another tab for that activity when you know when is too much uh, mm. blending too uh, you know where do you, where do you find that balance and and um, where do you stop I guess is another mm. uh, question to consider. And the blend of tools and platforms that you've got to choose, you, you can't have everything. I mean, some of it's just not fit for purpose. So you've got to have that blend, that combination of which tools um, are you going to use for delivering input, you know, providing teacher input, and what kind of tools and platforms are you going to set up and accommodate for student output and for student interaction. And that sort of blend is, is a new thing as well. Yeah, yeah. I, see, I see there's a... Like, um... A comment from Manjit in the in the chat and yeah it's sort of what I was referring to earlier because it's sort of that sort of asynchronous um, blended learning because it doesn't happen at the same time right so you've got this one day but then you've got that the other day um, so yeah that that's definitely I mean you can definitely interpret that as blended learning yeah hmm. but interesting that we have to ask ourselves we feel the need to ask ourselves is that blended there's still that feeling of confusion or 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 need for clarity yeah. And I guess, Kirsty, in, in the model that you're talking about in your context with the, the asynchronous and the synchronous delivery um, of online classes, I guess there's often a shift away from the teacher as being a source of all knowledge to being someone who's a facilitator or a guide. Mm -hmm. um, and how can we support teachers to make this shift? Um, we were having a really long conversation about this, Heno, weren't we, last week? Um, one of the most important things is to be really clear about teacher expectations from your, your senior teaching staff and your teaching centre. I think that that's one of the first things that needs to be really modelled and demonstrated and voiced really strongly is that teachers are not expected to do this live streaming four hours of synchronous input from a, a video conferencing platform and that there's often um, a deep-seated feeling within teachers that that's what they're supposed to do and that by not doing it, they may not be doing their job. So we have to really um, voice those teacher expectations of sometimes you need to be synchronous, you know, through a video platforming, video conferencing platform, and sometimes you need to be asynchronous. Sometimes you need to step back, um, facilitate, let them be independent, let them have time within your class time to do independent, um, asynchronous, um, independent work. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, get comfortable with, the, with those periods where you're not on, 
and lean into it sort of, you know, because that's the way it needs to be. And you need the break and they need the break. They need the variation of input. Um, you know, it, it, it's good for everybody and it, it's sort of, it's more sustainable. It'll, it'll avoid teacher burnout and so, uh, and so on. But something else that I actually spoke to a couple of colleagues about today too is, is that, that messaging also needs to be consistent, but it also needs to be repeated um, because in that initial, you know, emergency transition, there's so much information, you know, you're, you're being bombarded with emails and, 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 and all kinds of different tools and texts and processes that that sort of message can easily just um, fly under the radar. Um, so it needs to come back and it needs to be, you know, teachers need to be reminded that it's okay and this is what's expected and you don't, and this is what's not expected as well, which is just as important. So yeah, co consistent and repeated messaging, I think is a, it's key in that process too. Hmm. Yeah, I think Manjit's just commenting that low level students often struggle with this concept. And I guess, um, I, I know the other day we were talking about the idea of learner training as well. Um, and, you know, helping teachers to, um, learn about training their students in the asynchronous space too. Yeah, and the teachers are going to need to have that confidence in that themselves to be able to clearly train students and demonstrate that and keep that messaging going to their students as well, that this is normal and this is what's going to happen going forward and that we're going to have new um, routines and new patterns that you may not have experienced before, but that's okay. Yeah, yeah, totally. I, I like um, the idea of seeing it as a routine um, mm. because people, I think, respond well to routines in class in classroom environments. Um, and I also liked what you said, Heno, about it being a variation in, you know, in teaching, which everybody needs. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. And I think also, and I'm thinking especially with these sort of lower level students too, also letting them know that you are sort of still there if they need you. So having those sort of support structures in place, um, you know, so if they're working on something with someone else and they, and, and they get lost or they get disconnected or whatever, that there's, you know, different channels that they can, you know, come back to you um, from or through and, um, you know, making sure that you've got those sort of uh, clear support structures. So if this happens, then we do this. But if that doesn't work, then we do that, that type of thing too. Yeah, a period of time where we would normally do orientation or some sort of um, uh, introduction to the course needs to be either changed or supplemented with that new kind of training, how to communicate with your teacher for questions, for support with your, your classmates to seek feedback and, um, and doing it more than once, but starting at the very beginning like we would with any other kind of student training. Yeah, absolutely. And it's sort of one of those affordances of this um, uh, online learning too, is these um, digital literacy skills that the students pick up along the way, and teacher teachers too, obviously. But, you know, there's so many, uh, if you just think about it in a sort of different way, there's so many benefits to it because it's one of the things that the, the, the academics and the lecturers often come back to, um, say, the pathway program teachers and staff too, is, you know, um, they complain about students not being able to send an email correctly or whatever it might be. And um, through this online learning, they, they're learning all these skills, you know, asking for help, um, setting up their, 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 um, their learning environment, um, learning how to sign up to all these different tools and, and whatever. And so many wonderful skills they're learning that are, that'll set them up for life, really. Okay. So when COVID hit, teachers had to learn to use a lot of new digital tools very quickly. And I think you've spoken about that, Hannah, already. What training did your centres use to support teachers with this rapid transition? And were any particularly successful? Um, Kirsty, would you like to go first? Yeah, sure. Um, we, we obviously needed to do some very initial training in the very quick transition stage. And we had initial training with asynchronous and synchronous platforms that we had sort of chosen to be our base. So we had initial trainings in Zoom and Moodle, which were going to be our, our main platforms. And we really targeted that initial training at teachers being able to 
competently manage three or four functions on each of those platforms um, to start. They didn't need to be perfect or proficient, but you know, competent in three or four functions on each so that they had that foundation and they could go in there and just sort of get started. That was our initial training. And in the first few weeks, months that followed, um, two main areas that really helped um, our teachers and, and us uh, was the daily drop-in session on Zoom that we just sort of made open door, essentially. And it meant that people could drop in at last minute at one point every day and ask any kind of question that had come up at that moment because we found that they those were the questions that produced um, the most panic and the most need was something's gone wrong now, today, what do I do with this discrete problem? And secondly, um, starting to create, because we didn't have them before, uh, a bank of really short videos that addressed one specific technical tool or technical problem or technical procedure so that when uh, teachers asked these questions and needed the answer now, we would have a video ready to shoot off immediately to them that was um, uh, a screencast of their computer screens. Click here, click here, then this will happen and then you can do this. And that was really time saving for us and, um, and really addressed the just in time need that the teachers seemed to have in those first weeks and months. Yeah, that's, um, uh, it's interesting all of those little, uh, little support structures you had in place. We had similar, um, similar things, but also slightly different um, in different ways. But yeah, those, those little videos definitely, I think were, were really, really helpful um, during those, especially during the initial sort of transition. Um, and of course the workshops too, sort of scaffolded workshops, starting with the basics of what you need to know and then sort of working towards more advanced um, skills, skills for engagement and so on. Um, and obviously the, you know, there's, there's always going to be um, some people who pick it up faster than others. So also we were very lucky at ICT to, um, to have the resources, to have a, a team of people available to, to help with one-on-one -on -one training sessions, whether it be face-to-face -face before we all, you know, went into isolation or whether it was um, online through Zoom. And um, we also had a, a dedicated team who were available for sort of two shifts. There were always two or sometimes three people available who could jump into a Zoom class and help out with any technical questions or problems that there were, um, which were, that was really, really helpful too. Um, and I, it's good to see Alice is in the audience here because Alice also um, had this fantastic idea of setting up these pods. Um, my colleague Alice from ICT, um, these little convener pods and, and team pods of teachers who were teaching together. Um, and similar to your drop-in sessions, you know, we, they, we'd have a weekly sort of um, a meeting where, where the convener of the small pod would meet with their teachers you know, find out how things are going, just a bit of a check-in, like you would do with your students, um, you know, a bit of a check-in in the morning. Uh, we'd have that with the, with, the, with the teachers and it's worked wonderfully. And, you know, it's a practice we're, we're still continuing. So it's been really good, um, that sort of support structure. And I think uh, we spoke about this last time. Also, you have all these, you know, just like in an online course, if you're studying an online course, you get these different kinds of learners. If you're doing like a, a MOOC, a massive open online course, you get the active participants who jump in and do everything or the, or the passive ones who sort of just, they just want to absorb the knowledge or you get those who, who sort of pick the, you know, just cherry pick the information that they need out of the course mm -hmm. or you get, you know, you get those who sort of, they just, they just lurk in the background and it's the same with with um with sort of teacher training in a sense because we're all different learners so you've got to cater to these different styles so you know someone might want that one-on-one -on -one training other people are happy just to watch the videos or or watch a recording of something other people like to do it in a, in a workshop so being having all those different sort of synchronous and asynchronous training structures in place really uh I found catered for all of those different tastes and needs. I actually think that's been one really positive benefit of this whole COVID transformation is that we've all got a bit better at providing that variety of teacher training. It's not as much one size fits all as it possibly was in the past because we've all had to deal with um, 
different different learning styles, but people are under different levels of stress and people with different time commitments. And those kinds of changing needs have really reinforced that need to offer a spectrum. And I think we've done it better. Yeah, absolutely. And I guess with all of this being so under the pressure, as you say, and so time poor, those little um, short, just in time um, nuggets of, of gold, of information and training, you know, the micro learning moments, um, they've really sort of come to the fore. And I mean, that's something that you're really good with, with your videos and so on. So I think they've really become a real valuable asset in, in teacher training. Yeah, totally. Mm, yeah. And I think I would add to that, that it was certainly the there's been a resurgence of individualized professional development over the past year and people really taking control of their own development because everyone was learning such new skills. Um, and I think, as you say, Kirsty, it's really challenged us to look at the way that you know, professional development is opportunities are offered within our centres. And I agree that we've seen some really great developments in that area. Yeah. Mm. So I guess there's been a lot of talk about whether to observe teachers in their online lessons or not. Um, you know, some people say it's too early to do that. Others say, no, you know, um, observations are all about development. Let's get in there and do it already. Um, so, you know, has your centre been doing observations of online lessons? And if so, how and when, how's it working? Kirsty, would you like to go first? Sure. Um, yes, we have uh, restarted formalised observations. We definitely did pause for, you know, six months, eight months while everything was sort of transitioning and steadying itself. Um, but we did restart in October and... I think um, the culture of sort of team teaching and co-teaching that already exist in the centre before we went online uh, and then transition to co-teaching and team teaching online um, really, really helped with that. I think that there was much more comfort with the idea of someone just dropping into your online class and um, observing you and you feeling nervous about another teacher observing you was a lot easier to handle because there had already been a lot of that team teaching in the months between sort of March and October before we restarted formalized observations. Um, there was a lot of examples of teachers being offered team teachers, uh, team teaching or um, teachers themselves requesting it. And um, uh, one of the teachers or one of the senior teachers sort of dropping in to help demonstrate or model how something could be done in an online class or how an alternative activity could be done in an online setting. And that culture of people dropping in and witnessing, watching, observing was there. And I think that really helped the formalised observations restart to a good successful restart. Yeah, I think um, we've sort of taken a, a, a a left turn on that journey, um, whereas you've taken the other road. We, have, we haven't restarted any of those um, formal observations as far as I'm aware. We did have wonderful initiatives before, um, you know, before March last year, peer partnerships. Um, that, you know, there was, uh, we had a wonderful little team of um, professional development senior teachers who um, would go into classes and offer help and, uh, and advice and, and observations and so on. But when we went in line, I think, um, like you said, with, with your centre too, um, sort of it went on hold, but we just haven't restarted that yet. And I think uh, actually though, it does offer great opportunities. And as Cara says in the chat too, you know, um, with the recording function and so on, it's, it's really easy to, um, to set these up. Um, but I think, yeah, it, it, if you've got that culture going and you can restart that, then it's probably, uh, quite easy to to fall back into that routine and that expectations and habits but yeah we, we haven't done that yet hmm. yeah I know um Cara's made a really interesting comment in the chat about 
how remote peer review is easier if uh, becomes easier because teachers can re record certain parts of their lessons and share them with people and I know some colleges have actually been using snippets of people's recorded lessons in their PD training sessions um, and I think you know it, it is a great affordance of the technology as well to be able to share your lesson more broadly, but also choose aspects of it that you're confident um, about to share more broadly with other people in your staff room as well. Um, just speaking about Kara's comments there, she's asked about the sort of purpose of the observations. And um, uh, in answer to Kara's question, it's kind of both. It was definitely about providing reflection and feedback. But when we observed teaching that we we thought was not meeting specific standards it was really dealt with in that um let's let's find a way to you know tweak this to make this what you want it to be to get back to the point that you um your high standards that you are used to delivering so it was a combination but it was definitely a formalized observation where um teachers realized that there was you know things being filed and and um it was it was a sort of requirement of the job, but it, it was delivered and followed up, hopefully, with that aim to provide feedback and provide support. And what about this to help you? Yeah, I love the way you framed that, actually, you know, with it helping you get back to those standards you're used to, um, you know, with all that experience you've had in the past, because um, I guess in a way that takes the pressure off, doesn't it? You know, where everyone was new to online teaching. So um, I guess the the expectations were different in observations. Yeah. yeah just, just a quick point on that, though. Um, so if you're sending questions in the chat, just make sure you send it to all attendees too, because otherwise um, the others can't see what the questions are that you're referring to. I might just copy what, um, what Cara said there so everybody can have a look at that. But um, just to add to what I was saying earlier, just because we didn't have the formalized observations, it doesn't mean that there wasn't this culture of sharing. And so we had actually had a really fantastic, um, you know, flurry of people trying to help out in a sense. Uh, it, it got so much uh, at one point with, that we had to say, guys, like we're going to use this one channel of communication to share and support each other rather than here's an email, here's a Zoom chat, here's a this, here's a that. Um, and, and we sort of got our structures in place and our processes. And since then, there's been these wonderful, you know, resources shared and ideas shared and not just um, sort of in those pots that I mentioned, but also across the whole teaching um, body, basically. And um, yeah, I, we were talking about it earlier. I mentioned that we've got these Zoom channels and you guys said you hadn't actually seen them before. Um, and yeah, we've been using those instead of say uh, Microsoft Teams or WhatsApp, we've been using um, these Zoom channels just to keep everything in the same sort of environment. And I'll, I'll see if I can show you quickly. I'll do a little screen share here. And this is sort of what it looks like. You can see on the side here, you've got um, these different ones. And these are sort of our, our Zoom channels that we've got here. So, um, you know, this is a course that I'm teaching on or that I just finished teaching on. And you can see um, Alice sharing resources here. And um, it's a sort of like a news feed type thing. So there was a lot of sharing going on um, through it all. And this has been really, really helpful, I think, for you know, all the teachers just getting involved with that and, and, and jumping, oh, what am I, is there anything for this week that I, because it's all adapted for online, you know? Normally you've got these, these folders full of, things but it's all for face to face so um you know knowing that you've got these custom made resources and activities and tips for online teaching has been really really useful hmm. yeah i guess that leads really nicely into the next question i had which um was about the kinds of teacher collaboration that have emerged at your centers during covid um mm -hmm. in the absence of a you know, face-to-face -face staff from environment. Jump the gun there, sorry, Sophie. No, okay. <laughs> um, Kirsty, would you like to, to sure. comment on that? It was fantastic when you showed us, Sophie and I, those Zoom channels last week because it's, you know, there's, there's more of these ideas coming out all the time, how to encourage this kind of collaboration. And we need to use the best model because there's so many choices we can choose the best one. Um, in our situation, we really encouraged... Um, our teachers from the beginning to opt with their class or their classes for a third platform. So as I said before, 
we were really relying on Zoom and Moodle as our dual platforms for delivery. And uh, we encourage teachers to have usually a phone-based third platform, something like WhatsApp. And in the beginning, it was done um, with the idea that if there's a huge technology fail, you can always go to this other form of technology. You know, your, if your computer dies, you can still get on the phone and tell them uh, which part of Moodle you want them to look at while you get things organised. But that WhatsApp channel quickly became a teacher collaboration channel. And um, larger groups for sort of all the general English teachers or all the academic English teachers and subgroups within that of who's teaching Monday of this course um, were set up amongst the teachers and became a really, really important source of support and collaboration and sharing. And, um, and they have stayed quite solid up until now. Yeah, that's... Um... We also sort of tried that third channel um, and that was more sort of for the students in a sense, you know, if you, you couldn't get onto Zoom or you couldn't get onto Blackboard, which we used, um, you know, um, what's the third thing? And we were using sort of Padlet for that type of thing. Um, and of course, they could also email the teacher, but no one ever thinks of emailing. <laughs> but um, yeah, so but for teacher collaboration, like I said, those those Zoom channels have been really useful. Okay, um, I guess I just want to leave an opportunity for the audience to ask any questions before we finish up with with our questions. Um, so, members of the audience, if you have anything you'd like to ask our panelists, then please do type your questions into the Q and A box. Also, if you have any comments about what you've been doing in your centres. Um, that would be wonderful if you could share them with us. Yeah, I'd love to hear what's worked, you know, what's been really good um, at other places. I mean, and that's that's something that has been really fantastic about not just the SIG, but our industry here is to all the sharing that's going on. I remember, you know, in that first initial week when the news broke that, you know, we're going online and so on, there was these wonderful emails being sent um, around from all the member colleges about, you know, this is what our timetable is going to look like or thinking of looking like, these are the tools we're planning on using for synchronous and asynchronous. And it just helped everyone formulate their plans and, and, and get it all together. Um, so that, that sharing has just been amazing, not just within the centres, but, you know, across the member colleges. Yeah, absolutely. Just to extend on that, Henna, I found it equally as interesting what sort of happened in the second iteration. Like we all sort of pivoted on a dime in March and went, oh, okay, let's go online. And then we learned so much from that first cycle and then refined it in, you know, May and June, July when we started repeating courses. And, and those kinds of experiences, if people have those suggestions or um, learn, you know, learned tools please share them because everybody learns from that. Yeah, especially when it when it came to assessment time and everyone was thinking, oh, how are we going to do this? You yeah. know, yeah. what are you doing? What are you doing? Yeah. Um, you know, that's where the, where the SIGs really come to the fore, I think, with those types of uh, moments. But absolutely, and I think we are at that stage too now where we've sort of got a little bit of, of breathing space and it's time to, to evaluate and look back and see what worked, what needs, what needs changing, what you know, what processes can be streamlined, and um, what can be reintroduced from what was left behind. Um, mm -hmm. I think it really is an opportunity to to start looking forward and uh, and build and develop and plan more sustainable practices and processes. So I think we're on the cusp of that um, at the moment, at least where we are. Yeah, no, I agree. I think we're sort of, it feels like a time, doesn't it, where we're, we're acknowledging, okay, we've got something here. Now let's, let's solidify it. Let's get some firm footing and, and um, really increase the pedagogy of it again, rather than the sort of uh, warp speed delivery. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I guess um, we haven't had any questions come through from the audience, but um, you know, 
I'd like to ask you where to from here for Elicos. Is there a sustainable way forward after emergency remote teaching? Um, I guess you've touched on it a little bit with uh, this year being about consolidation, reflection, um, you know, reinvention based on that reflection. Are there any other comments you'd like to finish with? I'm an eternal optimist. I actually think there is a future for Elicos. Um, I know people probably disagree with me a year ago and a few more um, maybe still do, but I do think that there's um, the fact that we had students sign up online and we've had for students come to us in this environment as new students is really an indication that there's still a need and there's still a service that needs to bridge, particularly in pathway courses. They seem to have held really strong. And I think going forward, um, we can't put the genie back in the bottle. Everybody's worked out that this can be delivered as a product online. And even when face-to-face -face starts again, um, we'll need to have a product which is flexible and is really high quality, but can be delivered in the classroom and online. And also a product that um, could be started in the classroom and in the event of future lockdowns can change to online without it affecting the quality. Hmm. Yeah, it's really interesting to hear about uh, colleges that have, they're sort of designing their curricula so they can be flexible to be delivered online or face-to-face -face and really what's um, where they're adding information is in the teaching notes. So they're sort of like, if this is online delivery, it can be done this way and if it's face-to-face, -face, then adapt it this way. Um, so it's a really interesting development. Yeah. It is. Um, I, I share your sentiment, Kirsty. I'm maybe, maybe I don't know. Maybe I'm a little bit less optimistic. I think there's a future, but it, it will. It needs change. So mm -hmm. I think all the students who are still signing up online, they still have this expectation of completing their studies face to face. So they've got a different expectation. So I think that when when we get students signing up online and they know that the rest of their studies are going to be online and they are happy with with the online delivery and they they paying a price that's equivalent to the quality of the online delivery i think that is possibly um the future not that the other ones won't happen but if we can get students signing up from overseas or wherever the, they may be obviously overseas mostly and um it's for the quality of the online course and the education that they're getting that would be a win and a real success. Um, but that would take real development in terms of online course development, not just a transition of a face-to-face -face course online. Um, and I think that's a longer process, but I don't think it's, um, you know, there, there are models out there and you can look at companies, you can look at um, guys like E2 out there who are getting students signing up for online, purely online courses. It's a different model, but, um, you know, things will have to change drastically, I think, it, for that to be successful within any class um, more widely. Hmm. And then an extension of that, we, in terms of getting serious and committed about um, course design, learning design, there needs to be an equal commitment in time and resources to assessment development, because development, that's been an ongoing struggle in Elicos is keeping up with the need for new assessments. Um, and, and I don't think there's been the same kind of need for new assessments in the past, so there'll need to be a recommitment to creating those. Hmm. I see there's a nice comment there too, that you, you know, tapping into, um, uh, markets that you normally wouldn't have tapped into that couldn't afford English. And again, yeah, that's absolutely an opportunity there um, for, for many centres to, to um, you know, tap into these markets where you've got huge numbers of students who maybe couldn't afford to come and, and study Elicos here, um, who now might be able to afford to study it online, um, you know, in a, in a different context. So definitely opportunities there as well. And uh, with the question that Madeline's posted there about um, the compliance, I think um, NEAS and especially TEXA have been, you know, they've been very accommodating as we've needed to change, but I think that they really have strived and are continuing to maintain standards 
because they're very aware of that um, reputation aspect of international education. And I, I think that um, my experience is anyway that um, our centres are being very conscious of that, um, not maximising beyond 18 students in a class the same way they wouldn't in a face-to-face -face situation and really making sure that they're um, uh, using, you know, accredited trialed um, uh, mapped assessments and, and maintaining that quality with an eye to maintaining their reputation. So I think not only are the sort of uh, compliance bodies monitoring that, but I think teaching centres are being really mindful of it as well. All right. Well, thanks everybody for coming along and joining in the discussion. Um, there were some really interesting points being made in the chat feed there. Um, thank you again to Kirsty and Heno for this discussion. Um, it was really lovely to hear your thoughts about this, um, you know, because I know that you've been very intric intricately involved in the training of teachers um, in, you know, the blended and the online space as well. Uh, so thank you everybody. And um, we'll uh, email you hopefully tomorrow with a link to this recording and also information about how you can access your statements of attendance for the session. Thanks Sophie. Thanks everyone. Yeah, thanks for coming along.